We are looking at the last globular cluster in the Messier list, Messier 107. There's a trope on this channel that none of us like talking about globular clusters because they're all really boring. So this is the last one. M107 is actually, if you want to find out the sky, it's in the direction of the constellation Ophiuchus, which is famous for being the 13th constellation on the ecliptic, which is the line that the sun and all the objects in the solar system take through the sky. Famously, it was left off of the zodiac signs because why would you want 13 zodiac signs and not a nice round 12 right, rather than 13? So if you were born between the 29th of November and the 18th of December, technically the sun was in Ophiuchus and not Sagittarius when you were born. More evidence that astrology is falsifiable twaddle. <laughs> yes. M107 is actually one of the objects that Messier left off the original list when it was published because it wasn't actually discovered um, until 1782 by Messier's assistant, Pierre Michon. By that point, you know, the list was already accepted for publication and everything, so it was left off. Messier 107 was actually added along with Messier 105 and Messier 106 by Helen Sawyer Hogg in 1947. Now, Helen Sawyer Hogg is one of those like hidden figures of astronomy that none of us ever actually learn about in school or university, but she was massively influential. Throughout her career in astronomy, she published four very big catalogues of globular clusters. But there's another name attached to Messier 107, and that's Peter Osterhoff. Peter Osterhoff was the co-head of the Leiden Observatory along with Jan Oort, so the Oort cloud in the solar system is named after Jan Oort, because M107 is classed as an Osterhoff type 1 globular cluster. Now there is a massive trope in astronomy. We classify everything into type 1 and type 2 and everything's supposed to fit neatly, you know, like think of supernova type 1 and type 2. You've even got like active galactic nuclei that are powered by, you know, growing supermassive black holes, but you see them from different angles. So they're classed as type one and type two. And then you've got radio galaxies you know, that emit radio light. They're classed as type one and type two as well. You know, those types were often decided back when there was a lot less data, a lot less observations. You know, the sample sizes were much smaller. As sample sizes grew, as we got more and more data, you realize obviously it's, it's usually more of like a continuous distribution and you can't put some arbitrary threshold on it to make something into type one and type two. So, you know, with the supernova, we end up with type 1a and type 1b, <laughs> type 1c. I've even heard people talk about active galactic nuclei as well as like, oh, this is a type 1.8. <laughs> Just like, it's, it's just so ridiculous, right? In the case of our Osterhoff type one and type two globular clusters, at first glance, it seems to be that actually when it was decided, they were obviously clear cut, but now we've got this larger distribution and perhaps there isn't. But actually we'll, we'll get into that, okay? So I grabbed this paper from 1973 that talks about the definition that Osterhoff first decided on for these different globular clusters. It's all based on actually um, the variable stars within the cluster. What period do they pulse at essentially? So in a type one cluster, you have the stars varying with a period of around about 13 hours. And in a type two cluster, you've got the stars varying on a period of around about 16 hours. So on first reading, you think, well, that surely can't break into a nice sort of dichotomy of two different types. If it's just based on periods, that's going to be a, a fairly large distribution. And yeah, if you look at this paper, it's got figure two, you can see they've got type two globular clusters here and type one globular clusters there. And you can see actually there is sort of two peaks, but still the distributions overlap a little bit. But as people sort of investigated these type twos and type ones further, one thing they realized was it was not just the periods that split the two things out. They also found that there was a difference in how many heavy elements the stars had in each of these clusters. So we're talking things like, yeah, okay, fine, helium, but also mostly things like carbon, oxygen, nitrogen, and obviously some of the traditionally more heavier metals up to iron as well. So the way that we find out if stars contain those elements is we take a spectrum of the light from the star and you split it through a prism and you get this trace of the light and you see how much light of each wavelength or each color do we receive. And sometimes we see that there are gaps, these missing gaps, essentially where, you know, there's a load of carbon in that star that's absorbing that particular wavelength because the electrons are essentially stealing it away to gain energy. So type one Osterhoff globular clusters are classed as having slightly weak metal lines in the spectra of light from the globular cluster, which is sort of the spectra from all the stars in it. And type two Osterhoff globular clusters are classified as having 
very weak metal lines. So essentially what that means is that the type twos have very little metals in the stars, meaning that the stars formed from purer hydrogen gas in the universe, whenever that globular cluster formed. Whereas the type ones probably formed from less pure hydrogen gas, hydrogen gas that had been polluted over the years by previous generations of stars that had lived and died there beforehand, gone supernova and, and thrown out these heavier elements into the universe. So it looks as if if they've got these two different metal contents, then perhaps they formed at different times. Or the other option is that they formed in different places out of different clumps of gas that then gave them these different properties as well. So then in 2002, this paper came out and they were actually not looking at the type one Oosterhof globular clusters, like what Messier 107 was. They were actually looking at some of the least metal rich clusters. So the type twos, the ones that were probably formed from very pure hydrogen. And they were looking at their orbits around the Milky Way. So in the top left here, essentially this is the flat plane of the Milky Way's disc. Essentially that's where all the stars are orbiting there. So you're looking at it from the edge on. All the red dots are these very, metal pore globular clusters, the type two Osterhof clusters. And you can see they're all in this line above and below the plane of the Milky Way. And whatever direction you look at it from, essentially you see them in that line. And so what this paper said essentially was that all of these type two clusters seem to be lined up in like a plane, like a flat plane in how they're orbiting the Milky Way. Like they're all orbiting with the sort of very, very similar properties, which suggests they might all be coming from the same place. Like for example, uh, a satellite galaxy that was in orbit around the Milky Way that's been torn apart by the gravity of the Milky Way. And all the normal stars that was in that little galaxy have probably ended up, you know, just coalescing to become part of the Milky Way. But the globular clusters, which were, you know, held together by their own self gravity, probably stayed in this orbit and stayed, you know, looping around the very top of the Milky Way and looping down and under and over. And so that sort of settled the argument for a lot of people and said, well, the type ones have probably formed in the Milky Way itself a little bit later probably than the type two globular clusters that formed outside the Milky Way in a different galaxy and are now classed as part of the Milky Way because the two have merged together. And so it actually looks like these type one and type twos actually are separate distinct populations, perhaps at least anyway. Again, it's you know sort of getting more data and more data that hypothesis could change, but that's the one people are sticking with for now, which is quite rare for astronomy that you end up with type one and type two that are actually physically different uh, in their properties as well. So it means that Messier 107, you know, is sort of an OG Milky Way globular cluster <laughs> and that it formed, you know, in our own little backyard of the Milky Way. Then the question becomes, do globular clusters similarly form within their own dark matter halos? So I found this paper called Testing for Dark Matter in the Outskirts of Globular Clusters. So recall that dark matter is this elusive substance. Which is essentially, you know, how old is the universe? This is roughly what the Hubble time is. But they assume that.